you all feel you suffer from, but I, I, I've been involuntarily made chair of this session, which gives me huge pleasure, because we have two people whom I admire enormously uh, in the world of philosophy, but who actually have views that are rather different from mine, so I'm hoping very much they're off form tonight. Uh, the first speaker is David Papineau, who's, who lectured at Reading University, Macquarie University, Birkbeck College, and Cambridge University. Cambridge? I don't know. He'd, since 1990, he's been Professor of Philosophy at King's College London. No remission for good behaviour, by the sound of it. He was President of the British Society for Philosophy of Science between 1993 and 1995, and President of the Mind Association more recently, in 2009-2010. He's given lectures all over the place, all over the curved surface of the earth, but he's written many books and articles, including Philosophical Naturalism and Thinking About Consciousness, and his new book, Philosophical Devices will be published by OUP later this year, and he's going to kick off this session. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the whole conference a great, a great deal. Is that, is that loud enough? Uh, I'll shout a bit. Okay, well, Barry and I are the village materialist today. So we're going to uh, be taking the other side and uh, I hope that too many of you don't disagree too much because we've made a firm commitment to get us back into the pub by half past nine. So uh, <laughs> here we go. So, uh, so some people, we had the suggestion from both Ray and Peter earlier, take the view that contemporary materialism is a fashion, it's a fad, somehow encouraged by the success of modern science and computers, and uh, there's nothing more to it than that. And here's, I mean, here's a quote. I mean, before they talked, I, I, I thought I'll get a, get a uh, quote from literature. Here's Tyler Birch. Uh, the flood of projects over the last two decades that attempt to fit mentality into a naturalistic picture of the world strike me as having more in common with political or religious ideology uh, materialism is not established or even deeply supported by science. I think that's completely wrong. I think contemporary materialism has been forced on us by <coughs> recent scientific evidence. It's not a fad at all. It's something that's overwhel overwhelmingly dictated by, by modern scientific evidence. And it's very helpful to see this in... Uh, historical context, a, a fairly recent historical context indeed. Uh, I'd say that, that until about a hundred years ago, nearly all scientifically informed people, including scientists, were happy Cartesian interactionists. Well, now, when I say Cartesian interactionists, that's a bit misleading. They were interactionists in the classical Cartesian sense outlined by Peter earlier. Rather, they were what we might call Newtonian interactionists. They'd moved past Descartes' uh, atoms in the void. Uh, uh, well, Descartes didn't have a void, but uh, atom mechanical uh, materialism. They had uh, uh, rather more open-ended physics that had uh, various kinds of forces, disembodied forces, force fields that affected uh, the motions of matter. Uh, think of Newton's uh, force of gravity. And through the 17th, 18th, 19th century, scientists were perfectly happy to play with all kinds of force fields, chemical force fields, vital force fields, and mental force fields. And this was completely part of scientific orthodoxy until strikingly recently. Uh, so their view was fix all the the physical stuff, all the stuff that goes on outside bodies and inside bodies, there's still some extra stuff. The, the, well, the vital forces, but for our purposes, the mental forces. Take the phrase nervous, nervous energy. You all know, know, about, know about nervous energy. So he's so, so full of nervous energy. Uh, 150 years ago, that was an absolutely literal term. I mean, 150, 120, 100 years ago, uh, people using that term had in mind there was a specific force field associated with the nerves. And in deliberation, you built up the potential energy of that force field. And then in action, that potential energy was released 
turned into kinetic energy, your body moved. And somebody who was full of nervous energy was all pent up waiting to act. It was meant perfectly, it was a standard scientific motion. It was a specific force uh, that arose in the brains of intelligent beings, uh, nervous energy. Uh, so Ray gave us a quote from Dubois Raymond, 1842. So there were people back from the middle of the 18th century took the view that there weren't any forces apart from those found outside living bodies. Chemical forces, uh, physical forces, and so on, but no special vital or mental forces. Uh, one of my great heroes, Falk von Helmholtz, was a student of Dubois Raymond, and he carried on this program. But they were a minority. Uh, well, I mean, nervous energy, the notion, was subsequent to them. There were other serious scientists who thought that these people were being too restrictive about the range of forces there were. Uh, I won't go back even further. Sense and sensibility, uh, Jane Austen's title, common notion in the 18th century, sensibility. And there was a huge debate among physiologists in the 18th century about what forces went on inside bodies. There was a force of irritability that was to do with the muscles and a force of sensibility that was to do with consciousness. And then they debated about how exactly it works. And, uh, and that's uh, uh, the source of Austen's Austin's notion. Uh, we don't think like that anymore. Uh, I don't think anybody here thinks like that. I wonder. I mean, maybe we, we, we'll find out. Why not? I think it's a result of straightforward scientific investigation. Starting about 100 years ago, scientists were able to look into the workings of parts of bodies, into the workings of cells. And the more they looked, the less they found anything that couldn't be explained in terms of standard chemical, physical, etc. forces. And the, the, the crucial step was, was Huxley and <coughs> Hodgkin. 1952, they explained the transmission of action potentials by nerve cells, entirely electrical, electrochemical <laughs> chemical terms. And that's about the point when everybody became materialists. Well, when I say everybody, everybody within philosophy, certainly, and perhaps more, more, more widely. Uh, I'm old enough to remember Popper and Eccles. They carried on saying, no, no, there's places in the brain where there's something extra comes in and makes a difference. And we all started to think, no, these are funny, eccentric people. But the truth was, they weren't eccentric. They were just old. I mean, they'd grown up in the 1910s, 1920s, where that was just part of common sense, and they weren't giving it up yet. But most other people did. And that's when you get all the physical, philosophical arguments for materialism. And the form of the argument is very simple. Once you've got rid of vital mental forces, then you're left with something called the causal closure of the physical. All physical effects can be explained in terms of physical causes, the basic physical, possibly chemical, external wouldn't matter, uh, forces. And so now you've got this puzzle. Well, what about mental occurrences, like my deciding to get up in the morning, or my deciding to walk down the road, or my deciding to, to uh, uh, I don't know, pay a bill or something? Uh, surely these mental events have effects in the physical world. I mean, they clearly do. But how can they? if all physical effects are due to physical causes. I mean, doesn't that mean the mental events are just floating above doing nothing? Well, no, not if you are prepared to identify the mental occurrences with physical processes. To think of the mental goings on as constituted by physical processes rather than as something, something separate. And you have a whole slew of arguments in the 1950s and 1960s, Feigl, Smart, Putnam, Davidson, and Lewis, all arguing on roughly these grounds that you've got to identify the mental with the physical. Okay, now when, when I say that these arguments show you have to identify the mental with the physical, I don't want to be taken too literally. I don't think that means that you have to identify people with their brains, or indeed mental states with any particular physical processes. I think my, my car is an entirely physical thing with lots of physical parts, but I don't identify my car with any physical part of it. 
It's just something that's guaranteed to be there when you have a whole lot of physical stuff, but you can't identify the car as a whole with any physical bit. I don't think there's anything more to Manchester United football team than a lot of people playing football, uh, having various contracts. But if you ask me, well, what do you identify the team with some bunch of people? Well, there's nothing down at the level of people that you can identify the team with. But still, fix the people and the contracts, you fix the existence of the team. Philosophers talk about supervenience here. And what I'm trying to say is that all this argument really establishes is the, the supervenience of the mental on the physical. Think of it like this. If you have two setups that are physically identical, they've got to be mentally identical. There's no extra mental bit that can vary uh, independently of the physical stuff. Having said that, I, 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 I was curious about how to put this because I expected to disagree with what Peter Hacker said, but I don't think there was anything that he said that I want to disagree with. I don't think that people are the same as brains. People are much bigger than brains. Brains are parts of uh, human beings. I mean, I don't even want to say they're parts of people. Uh, uh, certainly, I don't want to say all the things that scientists said about brains thinking and uh, 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 parts of the brain knowing things and so on. I wouldn't want to say anything like that. Uh, the only point where I think I did want to disagree with what Peter said and, and where I think he contradicted what I'm arguing is when he took issue with Dawkins and Blakemore at the end of the talk, where they said humans are complicated machines. And I think there's nothing to object to in that. Of course, they're not machines like cars. They're much more complicated than machines. In fact, they aren't made of metal. They're made of uh, soft stuff and so on. And as Peter insisted, if they're machines, they're machines that can reason and have rights and so on, of course. But it doesn't follow from the fact they have all those things that they aren't machines. Some philosophers think that it makes no sense that at least conscious mental states should be constituted by physical goings on. I'm thinking here of David Chalmers and and Frank Jackson. But even they still respect a kind of supervenience of the mental on the physical. Even they, they think of the conscious realm as something extra produced, caused by the physical goings on. But even they don't think that the conscious realm can vary independently of the physical realm. They think that what's happening at the conscious level is entirely fixed by what happens at the physical level. Not across all possibilities, but at least in the actual, actual world. Because since they respect the scientific evidence and think that all physical effects have physical causes, they recognize that any mental variation that didn't correspond to physical variation just wouldn't show up in the physical world. And that would be very, very weird. OK, so I think that there's overwhelming evidence for at least this nomological supervenience of the mental on the physical. There's overwhelming evidence against the idea that there's some separate mental realm that can vary independently of the physical realm. And we can worry about the philosophical niceties later, but that's what I want to mean by materialism. Okay, so where does that leave us? Well, very natural worry at this point is that if materialism is true, well, doesn't it follow that there's no free will. There's no moral value. There's no value of any kind. There's no, there's no intentionality. There's no consciousness. There's no sense of time. And, uh, Ray gave us a whole list of things that wouldn't be there if materialism were true. Uh, well, I think Ray was a bit quick. He asked whether there were any sincere materialists who really thought there was intentionality in the material world. Well, Ray, I'm afraid... I can tell you there's an awful lot of us. There's a lot of us who've been working for quite a few decades trying to understand how there is intentionality in a material world. And I can give you a whole list of theories of this kind. And the same goes. Simon Bachman is going to do the same thing for value tomorrow. Uh, uh, I've been doing the same thing for consciousness, people compatibilists do it for free will. And so there's a whole lot of philosophical work, 
which is concerned precisely to show in John Searle's phrase how we fit into the world described by science. And to the extent that this philosophical program is successful, then those conditionals, if materialism is true, then there's no free will, etc., etc., are false, and you needn't, needn't worry. So I suspect, I mean, Ray might have done a little bit more work looking at what the philosopher said about these, these matters, but I suspect that some of you, even after you've looked at the philo what the philosophers say about these matters, might feel a bit dissatisfied. You might think, well, you get a kind of free will in the materialist universe, but it's not real free will, and you get a kind of mental representation, kind of machine-like tracking environment, but that's not real intentionality, and so on. Uh, you've got Simon Blackburn and uh, 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 kind of uh, sentimental responses. That's not real moral value. Okay, and you might well feel that kind of thing, and I, I have some sympathy with that, that line of thought. It's quite plausible that what you get in the materialist worldview isn't quite what you were hoping for. I mean, there's a lot of details. See, I mean, I actually think that in a lot of cases it turns out what you're hoping for is pretty incoherent. And what you get in the materialist worldview is a more solid and serious thing when it comes to, I don't know, free will. Right? The idea of real free will, which is com completely unconstrained by the past, that's kind of starts looking in here. Value ordained by some higher being. Uh, why somebody else's purpose is more important than, than mine. Uh, still, okay. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, there's arguments about whether what the materialist philosophers are giving you are the real thing. But if you think that, I put to you that you've really got to think carefully about your dialectical position here. See, if you're going to argue, look, you want to argue like this, look, if materialism is true, then there's all this bad stuff, no free will, life, freedom, no value, life is not worth living. But you know, of course, there is free will and there is value and life is worth living, so that's bad for materialism. And I think that's probably what a lot of people think. But if you're serious, you can't just leave it at that point. I mean, a lot of you might really be interested in getting at the truth and figuring out what to say about moral arguments, but there's another issue on the table. And Ray did mention this at the end. He did say, even if you agree with me, there's some unfinished business. There's how to deal with arguments for materialism. And that's something that you need to think about if you're interested in this argument. And if you're convinced that materialism has these bad consequences. Because if you don't address the arguments for materialism, you're in danger of lending support to this argument. Materialism says all these terrible things, but materialism is true, so all these terrible things really do follow. Life is not worth living. It's all terrible. Nothing is worth anything. And I presume that's not what we want to end up with. But note that if you insist on that condition and don't do anything about materialism, that's where you're going to end up. You're kind of lending weight to the people who think nothing is worth anything. Now, of course, one thing you could do is go back to the arguments I pointed you to at the beginning of this talk about uh, the scientific evidence for materialism. And you might try and show, look, perhaps that's too quick. Perhaps the scientific evidence doesn't rule out the possibility of a mental realm that varies independently of the physical realm. And we could discuss that. And some people do. But in, in my circles, it's very much a minority position. The scientific evidence is very strong. It's very difficult to get out of it. I mean, okay, you can go down that path. I'm not saying it's, it's hopeless, but, but good luck to you. But the point I do want to leave you with is if you don't go down that path and don't try and show what's wrong with materialism, then it doesn't seem a good idea to go on banging on about how if materialism is true, then everything is rubbish our array today, because you're only in danger of adding weight to the people, the nihilists, the people who think that really does follow, because materialism is true, and so there's no intentionality and no consciousness knowing anything. Uh, 
I think that if you aren't going to find a way of getting out of materialism, you'll do much better and join me and Barry and try and figure out how intentionality and value and free will and all the things that are important to us do exist within the materialist universe. Okay, now perhaps I've got five minutes left. I'm going to be quick. Perhaps I've been uh, pushing it at a straw man. I don't know. Rain, what do you think? Uh, Uh, <laughs> sorry, Ray, I, I, I thought I thought you think if materialism is true, then there's no intention. Mean, that's what you spent half an hour telling us. There's no intentionality, there's no sense of time, there's no consciousness, there's no sun, right? So, uh, seems to me you're in danger of establishing the conclusion you don't want to establish, that there really is no free will, no value, no intentionality. Uh, and that seems a bad idea. Uh, anyway, I want to now try a slightly different point quickly. Uh, it may be that nobody wants to disagree with what I've said so far. Maybe what you think about neuroscience and brains and people is nothing to do with these very general metaphysical issues about materialism and free will and so on. Maybe the issue that concerns people here more is the question of whether specific scientific developments, especially in neuroscience, can change our understanding of the lived world of real people. And perhaps there are people here who think that it's not possible for neuroscience to show us anything interesting and new at the level of the everyday life of people the kinds of things that Peter was talking about earlier. Now, I've kind of got some sympathy with this point of view. Uh, if people are just machines, they're very complicated machines, and we understand them very well, well in terms that don't involve thinking of them as machines. Uh, we understand them in kind of everyday logical terms, not in terms of categories built up from understanding their mechanical components. And in general, it's not a good idea to suppose that whenever you've got some large system made up of a lot of little bits, the only way to understand it is in terms of how it's made up of little bits. Often you can go straight in, look at its macroscopic properties, and have a very useful and informative theory of that kind. Putnam has a famous example. Why will this peg not go through this hole. Well, you could do a whole lot of quantum mechanics about the binding forces of the molecules and so on, but there's a much shorter answer, which is just as good. It's a square peg and it's a round hole. It doesn't deny that it's all made of molecules and so on. It's just that that's the wrong level to understand what's going on in this case. And you might feel the same about human beings and neuroscience. But I think it would be very odd to hold on those kind of grounds that understanding how the parts work can never illuminating, uh, illuminate our understanding of the whole. I don't need to know about the way my car works to be able to drive it and take it to the garage, but it doesn't hurt to know that it's got a clutch that consists of two friction plates that rub together, and if you ride the clutch all the time, you're going you're to destroy the clutch faster than otherwise. That's a very useful thing to know by figuring out how the car works. And I think the same goes <coughs> for our understanding of people. And I think what I'll leave you with, and what I think Barry will take up, is a few examples of how neuroscience has shown us better to understand how to understand the workings of people. I just want to look at the case of alcoholism, other kinds of addictive behavior. I'll do this quickly. It's just something that, that when I was thinking about this, it seemed to me an obvious example, partly because we've got people at King's who work on this. It's a very interesting question. Here are these people who have some kind of what looks like a compulsion. I mean, they can, they can see it's not a good idea, and they carry on doing this. Uh, why, why is it? Uh, well, one, one theory is that something has taken over these people. It's, it's overriding their rational psychology. Nothing to do with psychology. There's some kind of non-rational drive forcing them to, to these behaviors. 
And this is kind of associated with the idea that alcoholism is a, is a disease. There's another view. Uh, I heard a talk recently which, which took the line that, that by and large, alcoholics and other kinds of addicts, perfectly rational people, after all, look at how determined, systematic, and clever they can be at getting another drink, at, at, at getting, getting uh, their next uh, stash. Uh, and on this view, alcoholics come out as not that different from the rest of us, perhaps a little bit weak-willed, but plenty of people are weak-willed. Perhaps, right, this is what the talk I went to argued, that the characteristic thing about them is that they are in quite a miserable situation. They uh, have nothing much to look forward to. They quite rationally suppose that nothing is going to get better. Given, given all that, it's quite rational to have another, another drink. Uh, at least that will cheer them up for a bit. In fact, I've now become persuaded by my colleagues that none of these views really have it right that what really is going on with alcohol and other addictive substances is that they release, release dopamine directly into the mesolimbic system, and that produces a quite abnormal motivational structure. What happens with most behaviors is you do something, you get some intended result. If it's pleasurable, then as a result, dopamine is re released, and that uh, reinforces, uh, teaches you to do the same thing circumstances the next, the next time. Uh, the dopamine isn't the pleasure itself, it's something caused by the pleasure that then uh, marks the desirability of doing this thing again. What happens with addictive substances, and this goes for alcohol, uh, uh, cocaine, nicotine, uh, uh, I think sugar, uh, not marijuana, uh, is that it releases dopamine directly into the system without going through the pleasurable experience. So, so even though you don't expect it to be pleasurable, it isn't pleasurable, you still get the dopamine release and your body treats the result as something that's worth going for. And the result is, now this debate about exactly how this dopamine release uh, produces this effect, but the result is the, that alcoholics and other addicts have intensely strong desires, urges, cravings uh, for uh, the addictive substances, especially this is triggered by being in the circumstances which uh, is associated with ingesting the drug, like, for instance, having the drug in front of you. Okay, so where does that leave us? Uh, uh, I don't think it shows that alcoholics have some kind of compulsion that overrides their rational psychology. They're operating just like the, the rest of us. Uh, they've got they make plans, they're not going to have another drink, and then they find that there's some temptation that's pushing them to uh, uh, drop their intention. The kind of thing that happens to all of us a lot of the time. Uh, we form some plan, but uh, uh, you know, having fun in the pub, and uh, oh, what the hell, I won't, I won't go home and finish the paper. But it's also wrong to say there's nothing abnormal about uh, alcoholics and other addicts. Uh, it's not that they've just got a bad environment, I mean, bad prospects or they're slightly weak-willed. They have this thing the rest of us don't have, unconsciously powerful urges that are going to undermine their intentions. And so, I mean, is alcoholism a disease? I don't know, disease is a very common... Is there something abnormal, unusual about the alcoholics? Yes. And that seems to me very interesting and illuminating. In fact, I didn't used to think this. I used to have the view that uh, they're just in a miserable fix and it's as good a thing as they can do to carry on drinking. I've now realized that that's a mistaken view. And I realized it by being told about the neuroscientific mechanism that leads alcohols, uh, alcoholics and other addicts into their situation. So here's one case it seems to me that neuroscience clearly has added to my understanding of human beings, and not just extreme cases of alcoholics and drug addicts, but addictive behavior in general, which is quite common and prevalent among many people. So if you think that neuroscience can't illuminate the human condition, here's one example, and I think Barry will give you some more. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much indeed for a frontal assault on Peter and myself. We we'll, may have, Peter, you may want to have an opportunity to come back when we have to have the discussion. But I move straight on to Barry because we've got to rush because we're all dying for a drink, aren't we? After that, you know, sort of, <laughs> our dopamine pathways are absolutely racking. Barry, as many of you know, uh, is a professor of philosophy and director of the Institute of Philosophy in the School of Advanced Study, University of London, where he co-directs co the Centre for the Study of the Census. He's written mostly on the philosophy of mind and language, on the topics of self-knowledge and on knowledge of language. He co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Philosophy of Language with Ernest Lepore, and following his 2000 collection, The Questions of Fate, The Philosophy of Wine, he began working with psychologists, neurologists, and neurosciences on flavour perception. And he's done many other things. I've had many happy hours, or several happy hours with Barry, and he's a genius for an, an interesting aspect of the human metabolism, uh, which sugar is turned to alcohol, and then alcohol is turned to fantastic adjectives describing exactly the experience you're having. Anyway, it's a very great pleasure to introduce Barry, who will take over from David when he's... Um, there we are, brilliant, what a team. Ray. Uh, I'm going to try and amplify some of the things that David said, going in a slightly different direction, but again uh, coming up with a positive answer to this question. Can neuroscience contribute to our self-understanding? Yes, I think it, it can. And um, I want to start by kind of making common cause with a lot of people in this room, and, and, and I understand many of the things I've read and heard. Uh, Peter Hacker saying that uh, this, is, this is something that he would also approve of, and, and Ray certainly does. So we value subjects of experience. We take ourselves to be uh, locuses of value, to be important, uh, perhaps the creatures we care about most in our environment. And we want to deal with a rich conception of mental life that includes all of the things that go in there, our wants and wishes, our hopes, our fears, uh, the special awareness that we have when we're giving conscious attention to something, to ourselves, to things in our environment, to one another. And we think of our experience as comprising perceivings, imaginings, rememberings, choosings, reachings, recoiling, speaking, and listening. And I think if you're interested in any of those things, then you want to be interested in a science that attempts to tell you something about them or attempts to give you some insights into any of these aspects of our mental lives. Now, so I'm going to say yes, um, neurobiology and neuroscience provide insights into these activities, but that doesn't mean that the philosophy goes away because I think there's a healthy interaction between responding to the new results that may provide challenges and may actually require us to rethink some of the things we take as self-evident, obvious, and perhaps immutable I think philosophers have a habit of taking what's familiar as inevitable, and a lot of the findings have made us realize that things are not so inevitable. But what I also want to do is, is, is do something in two parts. One is to agree with David that, um, yes, neuroscience can give us insight into some facets of our, our uh, self-conception and of our mental lives more generally. But I want to go further than that. I want to say if you're interested in the nature of your experience, that um, the usual ways of trying to get to terms with it, namely introspection or just our common sense understanding of our own and others' experience can often be mistaken and that we might actually have to uh, revise our sense of what's going on in experience without giving up some of these categories, but, but maybe getting deeper insight into them. Okay, so... Um, can we do more? Can, can neuroscience make us think again about human experience and activity? Uh, yes, I think it can. So that's the, that's the burden of this evening's talk to try and tell you that. All right, now, I read the blurb for this and I had, I had the, you know, the terrible warning come up, churchlands, eliminative materialism. Now, um, look, if there's anything that's been going on in the cognitive neurosciences, and neuroscience is a young science, there are many aspects we're dealing from low-level, single-cell recording, we're dealing with physiology, right up to uh, people who used to call themselves psychologists and now call themselves neuroscientists and usually start with a picture of the brain and then just immediately go back into psychology. But um, cognitive neuroscience is actually not, I think the, the bits of it I care about, the bits I'm interested in and the people I work with, um, 
they're not eliminativists, far from it. And they're certainly not straightforwardly reductionists. Some of them may have ambitions that way. But the idea is sometimes finding correlates of our experience or, more interestingly, it's about finding out what is going on in the workings of the brain and some subsystems of the brain that give rise to and give shape to the experiences we have. Why is it that our experience turns out the way it does? Why is it that it takes the distinctive form and character it does? Is there something that's going to help us understand that? And even when that experience is misleading, there may be no way to overcome it just by knowing that it's misleading. It may be that we nevertheless find out why our experience can be misleading at times. Now, cognitive neuroscience relies on taking subjects' reports seriously. I mean, it puts people in the scanner and asks them to imagine things, to perform certain cognitive tasks. It's taking it as read that we know what we're talking about and that we're part of the common uh, group of persons who understand that we have mental states, perceptions, imaginings, rememberings, desires, and so on, when it tries to interrogate what might be some of the uh, underlying basis of this and what can, what can be the impacts on it of things going on in our cognitive system. So I'm particularly interested in this for this reason. Um, I'm interested in tasting, and I want to know what makes the experience of tasting, and especially complex experiences of tasting, which are rather difficult, complex and elusive, like the tasting of a wine, uh, a wine of any interest. And um, although I think we can get some insights into what's going on in, in these uh, experiences from the neuroscientists, I don't think it means that we, uh, we give up responsibility to try to understand how to talk about the relations between what's found out in the science and how things are in our experience ordinarily conceived. This is an old point that Sellers was fond of, that there's a scientific image and a manifest image, and it's the job of the philosopher to negotiate the relationship between these two, I think. So let's, do, let's look at insights, and, and one of the more interesting cases, because a lot of you will have heard all the headline stuff already, so I was trying to think of, you know, what, what have I heard lately that I thought was interesting, insightful, something I wouldn't have known just from my common sense psychology, and it's about um, interoception and emotional understanding of others. So what is interoception? This is the ability that uh, we do or don't have to monitor changes in our bodily state, changes in heartbeat, changes in breathing, uh, changes in adrenaline, the butterflies in the stomach and so on. When, when you're able to do that, when you're good at telling that things are changing in you, uh, it turns out that that correlates very well with you having a good ability to read the mental states and the emotional state of others. And it could be that people who are not very good at understanding others are also not very good at being aware of changes in themselves. Now, big questions arise about why that should be, and it may be that other people have an impact on you, an impact that goes below the radar, so to speak, subconsciously, and an ability to pick up on that quickly might give you clues about how people are interacting with you. But it's not something that we know just by introspection. In fact, we, I didn't know this at all until I started looking at this research. Of course, it's a very old idea, um, and, and I think it's a, it's a kind of nice amplification of something William James said. So, I mean, you know that in any psychology talk, people come up with a quote from William James saying that he'd already thought of whatever it was they're going to say. But my, my favorite crazy part of James is the part when he asks, what is this thing, consciousness? What do we mean by consciousness? And he said, well, when we're very still and we try to void the mind of any thoughts and we just attend to what's going on, what do we find? Breathing, he says. So he says, maybe consciousness is breathing. Maybe that, that's what it is. Now, it's, it's a lovely, crazy idea, but he, he's, he's onto something, not about what consciousness is, but he's onto something here. So he said, there are other internal facts besides breathing, intracephalitic muscular adjustments, etc., and these increase the assets of consciousness, so far as the latter is subject to immediate perception. But breath, which was ever the original of spirit, breath moving outwards between the glottis and the nostrils, is, I am persuaded, the essence out of which philosophers have constructed an entity which is known to them as consciousness. Now, the fact that he includes other things, uh, the muscular adjustments, this is, this is him getting on to the idea that... Uh, uh, something that conditions our consciousness and affects how we're conscious of others 
uh, is actually coming from the body and our own body. So you've got these, you've got your bodily state, you've got autonomic signals to do with your breathing, and you've got body and brain responding uh, to one another, and then the use of that responsiveness to other systems. So you can have a feeling of being aroused or you've got excitability, and that depends often knowing that you're excited, knowing that you're in a state of high arousal, which people who are in a state of high arousal don't always know, depends on this interoceptive processing. And in fact, it seems to depend on how good they are at paying attention to changes in their baroreceptors. These are the, the little receptors that control the pressure in the valves coming out of the heart that are going to control blood flow. So when you're, when you're uh, blood pressure is low, the baroreceptor is open, the heart needs to pump harder to put more blood in there to get your blood pressure up again. Now, Hugo Critchley and, and uh, colleagues in Sussex have, um, have done some fascinating work on the baroreceptors. And, and you might think, according to them, that instead of William James saying consciousness is breathing, you might think consciousness is heartbeats for them. But it turns out that Here's how we can test. It's a very strange test. We test whether people are good at reading their own bodily signals. We ask them to do the following. Okay, I'm going to give you a minute, and in, when I say start, tell me how many heartbeats you've had. So, of course, everybody goes like this or like this. And you say, no, 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 no. Don't, don't try to feel your pulse. Just tell me. And people say, well, I can't. And they say, just guess. Turns out just guessing some people are very accurate. Very accurate. And others are not. And they seem to be also people who are rather good at very quickly recognizing the emotional changes of state in a face. You can morph faces to, to bring about uh, moving from fearful to sad or moving from happy to sad and so on. These people are quicker, better at recognizing uh, other people's emotional states. So what's doing that? Well, of course, if you talk to the neuroscientists, they'll say, well, this is some sort of integrating of conscious states with bodily arousal in the right anterior insula, because everything's in the insula these days. You know, that's, that's the, the region that we're very interested in. It used to be the amygdala. We'll move on. But nonetheless, we're going to get, we're going to get this, this uh, story because we're going to find out that your ability to pick up on and detect changes in you will make you better at recognizing changes in others. And it might even be a course of training for those people who, for whatever reason, are very bad at social interactions and very bad at, at anticipating and reading other people. Making them more aware, giving them the ability to recognize their own state, as some evidence suggests, may make them better at reading other people. Also, nice work by Critchley showing that if you get people to do perceptual discrimination tasks, you know, where they're looking at, at stimuli and they're responding uh, to stimuli flashed up for 250 milliseconds or less. If you get them to respond in one particular cycle of the heart's beating, they're better than another. So there's a sort of moment to take, uh, uh, ideal opportunity to take advantage of your best state, to give your best call and your best judgment. Think of how that might affect people like marksmen when they slow down and decide when to fire. It may be that there's a kind of crucial moment that they're just in tune and recognizing I'm more accurate now. So there's a kind of general story about accuracy going with bodily arousal. Nothing I knew before and kind of fascinating in the idea that you might train people and you might modulate the level of awareness of other people by awareness of your own body. That's something new. That's an insight. So um, I think there's also, so here's the key hypothesis. Better interoception, better emotional awareness. You also have better emotional regulation. You can tell when you're getting angry. You can tell when you're uh, aroused or excited. You can do something about it. You can get more cognitive interaction with your emotions when your abil ability to respond to this is good. And we've also got perceptual acuity. But look, it doesn't mean the philosophy stops. Um, is that better at having or reporting emotions? Are we talking about interoceptive awareness, actual what awareness, conscious awareness, or are we just talking about a sensitivity that you have to the body that's having an impact on your awareness? I'm going to take questions at the end. So you might be wondering whether you're, you're talking about actual awareness or just things outside of consciousness that are having an impact on awareness. Still some philosophy to be done here. And again, there's a question of whether um, we can say self-awareness and other awareness depends on or is grounded in, or more strongly still, some people might want to say is constituted by uh, that kind of receptivity in interoception. I think it's too strong to say constituted by, but depends on. So it's an insight, an insight we can use. 
So there's philosophical work to be done once we know the results. Insights into tickling, because it's not all for the nasty things in life, as they say in neuroscience. Uh, why can't you tickle yourself? Uh, well, very famous research uh, done by uh, uh, Chris Frith, Daniel Walport, and of course, Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's uh, uh, more known for it. Um, this also explains the waiter effect. It's not just tickling, but the waiter effect. And it's the idea that we think that when we're going to pick up an object, we imagine in our common sense psychology that what we do is we look and we guide our hand to it by our, our eyes, but in fact that's wrong. We would be too slow at correcting our movements if we did that. If we were actually guiding our hand, the visual signals would be too slow. So what you do is you already somehow, something in you is able to anticipate the movement you'll make, but more than that, it anticipates not just the motor movement that will follow from a, a command, but, but the sensations you will have as a result of executing that command. In other words, you're expecting to feel something on your fingertips when you reach out for this. And usually, we don't pay any attention to it. We're not very aware of, of those sensations when we reach for something. Why? Because this, the, the answer is supposed to be, we predict the motor movement and we predict the sensations, or rather, something in us does this by having a copy of the uh, expected sensations and expected movements. And when there's a match, when you get the sensations and they match, that cancels out and we pay no attention to it at all. Now, um, that idea that you're actually making predictions and, and calculating has the waiter effect. I'm going to ask David to come and be my helper for the waiter effect. Come, come over here. To demonstrate the waiter effect, uh, very, very easy. So put your arm out completely straight. Oh, very good. No, no, no. Arm out straight. <laughs> palm up, palm up. Right. So I'm going to put this glass on your hand. Now, I'm going to lift that glass and your hand goes up. Now I'm going to ask you to lift the glass from your own hand with the other hand, and your hand doesn't. And it doesn't because you already predict the compensating movement that you're going to make. This is why you should never take a, a bottle off a waiter's tray, you know, it just goes like this. <laughs> don't do it, don't do it. So here's, here's neuroscience making a real difference to life, okay? Um, so um, that's okay, but can we know, um, can we know about our experience so, so, so we've got insights and the insights are sometimes funny. So tickling yourself is the same thing. Notice, um, if you're already predicting the sensations you're gonna have, then you know what they are, so you're not finding it funny. When you tickle yourself, you're anticipating and expecting you get it, it's not amusing. But if you're controlling a robot arm that's tickling you, so that you move and it moves, and you introduce a little delay, then you can tickle yourself. And notice that people who have uh, brain uh, brain abnormalities, like in schizophrenia, who often have delusions of control, a lot of schizophrenics can tickle themselves. So there's a control problem about movement. It's very interesting they have delusions of control. Okay, so this, this is nice work by Chris Frith, uh, uh, Daniel Walport. Now, onto the more serious claim. The charge is, can you actually know your experience unless you know the neuroscience? Well, we might think we can do it by introspection, but I think Experience is not, is often not, as it appears to be. And that might mean we have to have revisions to our conception of experience. Now, so for some people, so for some philosophers, they say, how could experience not be as it appears to be? Things appearing to be a certain way is definitional of experience. experience in experience, how things appear is how they are. That's what experience is. Well, I think that's a very Cartesian view, and I think it's wrong, and I think it neglects something complex in the structure of what we get when we try to attend to or be aware of our own experience. Because quite often, there's something that's the experience and then right hot on the heels of it is our way of taking our experience, a take we have on our experience, which is so close that we sometimes don't see there are two things and think there's one, but we can make a mistake in there in that taking our experience a certain way. And I just want to give you a few examples before I wrap up. So here, several examples. Nature of pain, nature of sensory experience, bodily awareness, action understanding, self and other. So I'm going to talk a little bit about deep brain stimulation and chronic pain and how that might revise our ordinary understanding just of the nature of pain or even our philosophical understanding. I'm going to talk about sen sensory experience, which is largely the thing I work on and I'm interested in. Talk about bodily awareness as involving a sense not just of feeling bits of your body and experiencing sensations from the body, 
but actually having a sense of ownership of those experiences too. Action understanding requiring not just action, but a sense of your own agency in acting. And then ways in which self and other are related more primitively and early in our experience than we might think. All right, so let's do nature of pain. So a lot of people who have chronic pain, it's resisted any treatment. They've had tremendous amounts of uh, psychosurgery or drug treatment and, and, and it won't go away. And so somebody may be having a pain in the thigh, which is absolutely excruciating, unbearable, it won't calm down. Now, recent technique, uh, some of it pioneered here in the John Radcliffe by Tipu Aziz and colleagues, um, find that if you, drill into, if you drill into the skull and very carefully plot your way down to, to a location, the uh, para-aqueductal gray, and you stimulate at just the right uh, frequency, the patient feels what they think of as enormous relief. Now, you sometimes will say to this, I've, I've seen this operation done, you say to the patient who's conscious throughout, you say to the patient, um, do, you, do you still feel the sensation in your thigh? And the patient says, yes. Is it painful? And the patient says, no. So what's interesting here is that we have as if the same sensation that you had previously, but what you've done is you've turned off the adversiveness of it. You've turned off the fact that it's, uh, it's, it was uh, or yuck or uh, that's gone. But the sensation's there. Now that's very interesting because I think philosophers tend to think of pain as a sort of typical mental experience, irreducible mental experience, which is just identical with feeling the sensation in a certain way. And realizing that there might be a complex structure, that it might be that we have the sensation, the somato sensation in the, in the leg, and then an aversion to it, and that you can turn off the aversiveness, lets us think of pain slightly differently. Now, throughout I'll give a government health warning. I can see Peter reaching for his pad. Um, the government health warning is that we can't always conclude, and we mustn't blithely conclude, that what we find out in pathology cases can be read directly back into uh, how we should understand normal function. But sometimes they can, and also we can perform certain experiments on normal subjects, which can reveal some of the complexity that remained heaven, uh, hidden and came to light in pathology uh, uh, subjects, in sad pathology uh, 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 patients. So I think there's, there's a kind of insight here which was missing from our own experience, but it may actually turn out to be quite a deep and important insight if we're to find out what pain is, and if we're to think about it in the right way. Multisensory experience, let me deal with this. How many senses do we have? Well, if you ask most people out there on Woodstock Road, they'll say five. Why five? Um, Five certainly seems wrong. I mean, we, we have this from Aristotle. We have five senses, and, and we've given up thinking that there are four elements that make up you know, the, the whole of the world, but we've gone on thinking we've got five senses. Well, you've got a sense of balance. That's pretty important. Uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if, if anything goes wrong in your vestibular system and those ear canals do not give you the right information, you lose your sense of balance. That, that has massive impact on the quality of your experience and actually has interactions with your vision and other things. Um, You've got, you've got proprioception. You close your eyes now, you know where your limbs are. You can feel where your limbs are even with your eyes closed. You know where they are. Kinesthesia, when you feel the movement of limbs. Um, but of course, I've only given you a few more. These days, if you ask neuroscientists how many senses have we got, they say uh, somewhere between 22 and 33. We're still arguing about it. Now that means that something very interesting is going on. Either they're using the terms in a very different way. Either when they talk about senses, they're talking about mechanisms or modalities that are individuated in a quite different way, but which might serve our ordinary, uh, serve to give rise to our ordinary experience. But we need, to, we need to work with them. We need to find out why the notion of five senses is no longer adequate, as it, as it surely isn't. Now, most of you all the time are having experiences that are multimodal. I mean, you, 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 you're hearing me, you're seeing me, you can smell the room, you can just about hear the air conditioning. Um, I mean, there's all sorts, you can, you can feel the chair under your feet, the grip of the pen. You're always having experiences that come 
in many different flavors and stripes. And notice that your experience feels unified. It's not as though it comes in parcels and packets. It's not as though you think, here's the hearing bit, here's the feeling bit. How do I put them together? Do I synchronize them? No, you have a, you have a regular, rich experience of the world in which it's continuously fed by seeings and hearings and smellings and so on. Now, that's interesting because we have come to realize that some of the ways we have of classifying our experience into, say, a seeing or a hearing are not so easily divided. Many of you will know, if you don't, I urge you to go and Google it after the session and look up the McGurk effect. McGurk effect, terribly important. Good nodding in the, in the back there, terribly important to this work. So McGurk is where you're watching a face and the face is making the, the, the facial uh, speech gesture of ga, ga, ga. But through the auditory channel, you're being played ba, ba, ba. What do you hear? You quote, hear da, which is exactly a glide, as linguists say, between ga and ba. In other words, you hear something you didn't get from your ears alone and you didn't get from your eyes alone, but the eyes and the ears are helping to make that experience of da. It's a very reliable, uh, it's a very reliable uh, illusion because if you put them on the screen and you've got a split screen with, with one mouth going ba and one mouth going uh, ga, you can, you can go backwards and forwards and go uh, uh, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da. It's very, very robust. Now, it turns out you might have thought, that's just a tricky case. That's where we've set things up in a funny sort of way. But no, it turns out that our senses collaborate and cooperate much more often and that the multi-sensory integration of senses is, if anything, it's the rule, not the exception. One of the cases I'm particularly interested in is taste. Most people think you taste with the tongue. You taste very little with the tongue. What you taste with the tongue is salt, sweet, sour, bitter, savory, metallic, we now think, maybe fat. Uh, you might have seven receptors. That's what you get from the tongue. You do not have receptors for strawberry, pineapple, mint, uh, uh, roast beef. That is smell. That does not come from the tongue. And in fact, when people have any, um, when people have any, uh, uh, I see, Ray, when people have any um, uh, loss of smell, when you have a loss of smell, people often go to the doctor and report, I can't taste anything. Now, a good medic will try them. Put salt on the tongue, put, put alum on the tongue. Salt, yes, sweet, yes, bitter. You can taste. And they say, well, that's all I can taste. So everything else is smell. But not only that, there's also touch. Whether a food tastes creamy, whether something tastes creamy or crunchy, that's a texture, a stringency in wine from the tannins is a feel, it's not a taste. And equally, you get the influence of the trigeminal nerve, the facial nerve, which is the one that rings bells when you're eating mustard that's too hot and you feel it at the top of your nose. And it also makes peppermint seem cool in your mouth even though there's no change of temperature. Now, all of that is what we call taste, but in fact, it's always touch, taste, smell, and the trigeminal. Some people think sound, people very near here in experimental psychology think, sound has an impact, um, maybe vision has an impact. So multi-sensory perception is, is the norm, not the exception, but we don't know that from our own experience and we're still convinced falsely that we're getting what we taste from the tongue. Okay, um, still, given that flavor comes about when we integrate touch, taste, smell, and trigeminal irritation, does that mean flavors are just psychological con constructs made by the brain? The neuroscientists immediately reach for that, psychologists reach for that. I don't think we have to say that at all. I think we can think of flavors as complex configurations, but they're given rise to by, um, they're given rise to by the food or wine itself, and we use our senses in concert to get them. And I'll just do one more because I'm aware of, um, let me do this and then I'll stop. Let me do this. Bodily awareness, sense of ownership uh, of the body. Now, how do you know that the limbs you're feeling now are yours? Well, there are terrible cases of people, uh, usually with right parietal damage, who, who have alien hand syndrome. These are people who say, this is not my arm. And if you say to them, whose arm is it? They might say to the doctor, it's yours. Uh, that's very funny, I would have three arms. I know it's strange, but you, you must, it's not my arm. Now, some of these people can still feel sensations in the, in the hand, in the arm. Now, if you prick them, you say, is there pain? And they say, yes. You say, whose pain is it? They say, I don't know. Maybe it's yours. 
Now philosophers, very famous philosophers, have said that um, it, was, it, it was not conceptually possible to experience a pain and wonder whose pain it is or to have a sensation and wonder whose sensation it is. But here's somebody asking this question and actually rather worried about it, bothered about it. Now, it gives us a temptation to suppose the following. It's not guaranteed, but it's a temptation. It's a lead, if you like, to say it's not enough to feel an experience. You also have to claim ownership of it. And there may be a system that's missing or damaged in these patients which fails to attribute that sensation to the person themselves. Now, I want to just say, my final sentence being that we're interested in persons. And I think we've too often treated people with brain damage, people with brain injury, as though they were utterly alien. They were these strange creatures. You have books written about them as though they're from Mars, the man who mistook his patients as a career, you know, as, as Oliver Sacks did. Um, you, now, you, 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 it's a sort of modern freak show. I really object to it, the sort of cognitive neurological freak show where we bring people out and we show these people in funny positions, you say, utterly unintelligible. But if we understand how our own experience is made and the many systems in us that have to cooperate and synchronize like an orchestra coming together to give a unified whole, we may realize that the self and self-knowledge is quite fragile and the fragility of self-knowledge may make us realize we are closer to many of these people and there but for the grace of God go I. Many of us might find ourselves in those positions. You might think to yourself, look, um, once we know how experience is made and composed and sustained by various systems, breakdowns in those systems might actually lead us to predict what the experience would be like, what would happen, what would go missing and how things would now seem. And so I think we should see ourselves as, why aren't we more like them? Why aren't we more like people with these conditions? That they are actually showing some of the workings behind this orchestrated sense that makes us what we are. So if we're not to take persons to be too exclusive and too remote from the whole range of human beings and human experience, I think we can see continuity and closeness and also gain some insight into ourselves. Thank you. I must say, as someone who, who ran stroke units and epilepsy clinics for many years, I completely resonate to what uh, Barry said at the end, uh, particularly. Um, we've had two talks, and I both very rich. One, I think, metaphysically more modest than the other. I think David was sort of implying that neuroscience had pointed us in certain metaphysical directions towards materialism. Mm -hmm. He may or may not have said that. I may have misrepresented him. Barry, I think, was making more modest claims for neuroscience that it can give us insights into ourselves which we couldn't uh, access from elsewhere. And it would be interesting to see how you feel about those two different uh, angles that we've had uh, tonight on the, pre the, 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 the um, role of neuroscience in solving some of our preoccupations. So, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. I have a hand here and then I have a hand there. So, uh, could you wait till you've got the microphone? And I'm standing up here so I can sort of moderate, you know. So, the gentleman just there with his hand up. And uh, Actually, I think, would, would you mind telling us your name? I mean, you don't have to, but I mean, um, and your sort of uh, provenance. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm proud of my name. My name is Fran O'Rourke from University College Dublin. Thank you for two very fascinating uh, papers. I was delighted to hear about the interoception, and the awareness of breathing and heartbeat and so on. I'd be more interested in what's happening at the level of personal self-introspection at the widest possible universal level. If I ask about myself, um, why do I exist? Why does anything exist? Going back to the opening statement that materialism has been forced upon us by scientific evidence. At the level of scientific evidence, what is happening here in this question? I'd be interested to know what you both mean by matter, and if uh, matter is something that's limited in space and time, is this question which I feel intensely, which I think about daily, especially when I go to sleep, is this something that um, is being activated by an infinitesimal portion of matter, which somehow relates to the totality of everything which is, everything that was, everything that ever will be, in other words, a minute 
quote uh, Pascal uh, by space, uh, the world contains me as a speck. Can I press the pause mind. button there? Can I press the pause button there? Can I make it, can I just perhaps reduce it, uh, because there's a lot, lot in the question, but what do you chaps mean by matter? <laughs> I'm more interested in the other question, what's happening when I ask the question, why do I exist? Yeah. Uh, why do you exist, why does anything exist, uh, pass? Uh, no, no, just, just uh, what, no, sorry, what, what, it's a very yeah. good question, it's a big philosophical I think, what debate, do you mean by matter? I think that, that, that was the, right. the bit, uh, yes. There's a lot of different things on, a lot of different ways of defining matter. I think for today's purposes, it's effective enough just to say matter is the kind of stuff that's found outside living bodies. That's what Dennis said. Uh, everything that goes on inside living bodies can be explained in terms of the same uh, stuff and the same principles as apply outside living bodies. That's, so, so matter is what goes on outside living bodies, and uh, living bodies are made of the same stuff. That's, that's the materialism. That seems contradictory. So matter is what is outside living bodies, but it's also inside living bodies. Why, why is that contradictory? I, I didn't say matter was only outside living bodies. Right. Because it was outside living bodies. Far off. Thank you. Yes. Barry, do you have an angle on matter? I mean, um, well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm worried about how to define matter. That, that, that will do to sort of get us at the, the thing we're interested in. But um, uh, like Chomsky and others, I think it's very difficult to, to define what we mean by matter material. But I, I worry that when we say that it's difficult to get at that, that um, that encourages some people to say, well, if it's very mysterious itself and consciousness is very mysterious, then maybe they're the same mystery. Uh, I, I think that's you know that's a bad idea can, to, can to reduce two mysteries to one. So I think we need to get clear what matter is, and then we need to do very hard work to find out how but I don't think consciousness in this context, sustains it. I mean, this is why I said it doesn't matter how you define it. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, I can think of about half a dozen different ways of defining matter. Uh, all of them will leave us with an interesting thesis that the mental realm turns out to be one and the same as something else, something you didn't expect to be the same as. And I can give you six different things, six, six different ways of defining matter, such so I have six different materialist theses, all of which are interesting to discuss, all of which are so I, I, I don't think there's a, there's a big issue there. Oh, well, thank you for that. Well, I, got a, I, got a, I think I got a hand up. Uh, did I have a see a next hand? I, was that, I can't remember the batting order of hands. I think I, there's, there's Peter, there's the gentleman behind Peter, there's, uh, uh, yes, so yes. So shall I go in the back? I, I can't work out the order in which they appeared, but would you like to go first and then Peter and then gentleman behind Peter? Is that okay? Thank you very much. So I was intrigued by both of the talks. Uh, thank you very much. I am Herman Phillips. Uh, may I go on, on matter? So. Of course, you might claim that physicists will in the end define what matter is. You might leave it to the physicists and there will be fields and there will be all kinds of things involved. involved. But the interesting question for the philosopher of science is, are you a reductive materialist in the, thin, in the sense that you think that the laws for elementary particles and fields and so on will explain the whole rest of the universe? Or do you think that at l higher levels other laws will be involved which cannot be reduced to particle physics and so on. So, I mean, material, you can't wave this off, these questions. Okay. Who'd like to pick so up that? David. Reductive yeah. materialism can be understood in a number of ways, so you define it in a particular way. Do I think that uh, everything that happens at large scale can be explained in terms of what happens at the physical level? Certainly not, but that's because explanation Explain means render it comprehensible to us. And if I give you the quantum mechanics of why this won't go into that, I'm not going to explain it. I explain it much better by saying it's a square peg in a square hole. But I'm reductive, not in a philosopher's sense, but in a loose sense. In this, in this sense, I think that everything that happens at the high level is fixed by what happens at the lower level. This is Kripke's way of putting it. Suppose God comes along and he puts in all the elementary particles, he fixes does he have to do anything else to put people, uh, uh, consciousness, intentionality into the universe? And Kerala says no. He's already done it. He's put everything there. Uh, well, are you a Laplacian as yeah, well, uh, yeah, Barry? I, yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, just, just to underline David's point, put it very simply, um, you could think there was just one kind of stuff out of which
which everything else is made without thinking there's one theory out of which everything else will be explained. No, no reason to think those two go together. Thank you. Peter, you and I will both notice that, that Barry moved between the brain predicting something and the person predicting something. We will let him off that one, but you had a question. I think your microphone needs to be a bit nearer, Peter, to your mouth. Yes, yeah, I see. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I was a bit puzzled by that because actually all you said was, well, you know, there's some machines that have rights and duties and there are some machines that are conscious and some machines uh, that are self, and so on and so forth. That doesn't seem to be good enough for the following reason. Um, because you're focused very sharply on physics and chemistry and not on biology, you're not drawing a very important distinction, namely that machines don't have a good and uh, they don't have a welfare and they don't flourish or fail to flourish. Some things are good for machines, but what is good for a machine is what prevents the machine from dysfunctioning. What is good for an animal is what helps the animal flourish as well as what helps it from dysfunctioning. So there are, there are fundamental uh, indeed axiological concepts associated with living by beings, which are not associated with machines. Now, if you come along and say, oh, well, those are just the living machines, then I'm going to reply, you're just misusing the term machine now. Uh, is that all that's at issue? Are the new term machines or are not machines? I'm sort of missing that point. Well, well you, 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 you'll give up the term machine. Sure. All right. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, when, when I said new machines, all I meant what I said in response to Herman, yeah. that uh, you know, everything about them is fixed by how it is with uh, the basic physical stuff and the rules of physics. Are you sure you don't take uh, legal advice before you plead guilty? <laughs> no, 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 thank I saw a gentleman with a hand up there. Yes, you had your hand up for ages ago. Sorry about that. And then the lady next to him. Yeah. Well, I've, I've come from a long way to be here. My name's Andrew Mullins. I come from Sydney. Um, I'm a part-time philosopher because I'm actually running a school in Sydney, but I'm doing a doctorate in the neural basis of virtue. And I think it's very interesting. I'm delighted with what I've encountered so far, so thank you. Um, this is a quick question, but it's a broad question. Um, I'm using Aristotle somewhat in my studies, and I realise that um, if I dig into people like Kandel and so on, um, his only conception seems to be either material or substance dualism. He doesn't seem to have any other possible solution. And that bothers me a little bit because Aristotle is not without some authority. Um, and Aristotle's starting point is we observe that man is free. And from that point, therefore, we draw other conclusions about man's constitution, if you like. So really just looking for a comment. Just Sorry. a reminder, uh, Eric Kandel is, many of you will know, is a very famous neurophysiologist who did some exquisite work on the synaptic base of memory. Yeah. I mean, you were, you were talking about a paucity of views between materialism and substance dualism. Yes, it's not so much your, yeah, your no, 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 no. But I mean, that's, that, that seems right that there are many others there. And, uh, you know, some people think, well, materialism must mean that all our properties are, so suppose you're, you're a physicalist, all our properties are physical properties. That no, doesn't follow. I mean, Aristotle himself pointed that out. You know, if you take a house, it's, it's made of physical material. But if you destroy it, but keep all the pieces. You haven't got the house, but you've got all the pieces. So there's a property of arrangement or structure, which is not a physical property, right? So I mean, of course, there have to be other things in there. And then we can get more sophisticated with forms of functionalism above that. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it is interesting how quickly the neuroscience community, and certainly people who talk about the free will debate, reach for substance dualism as though it's the only alternative, too it's quickly. It's a strong man. Yeah, it's a strong man. So, oh. but, I mean, the way I yeah. set things up, I just wanted there to be two alternatives. But my, my materials alternative is a very broad church and includes a lot of things which wouldn't really be within the reductionism. But I think Crippy's way of putting it is very nice. I mean, just ask yourself, once you put all the physical bits in place, is everything there? And if you think yes, you're materialist. And if you think no, you're a dualist or a pluralist think in addition to the, all the physical stuff, there's some extra stuff. And uh, it's just one or the other. So I'm 
famously, cr famously yeah, Kripke says facts about meaning aren't in there, uh, and I certainly want to have them. I mean, if you fix all the... the Kripke thinks materialism means that meaning is like a de facto. He does, yes, and I, I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, there's, there's good support. Can we just get that clarification, Barry? So Kripke said that everything was there, but not meanings and so well, on. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's, a he's against materialism. He's, yeah. Yeah. He, he defines it nicely, but he's, uh, but he's not against on the right it. side when he defines yeah. it. There's, there's a, a, I think there was just a hand up, and then the gentleman up there. So the, the lady, first of all, beg your pardon. Yes. Uh, um, speaking as a materialist, not a critical of a materialist, but I think this is an important point. Sure. Um, I actually feel um, a great sort of sense of gratitude to Bishop Barclay, because what, uh, as I understand it, what he uh, excoriated was matter, not material. Interesting that we have materialism, not materism. Why do we have materialism rather than materism? Well, because it seems to me that whatever the physicists are going to tell us from time to time, if we go, about what matter is or isn't, or about what matter energy is, or is or isn't, um, whatever that answer is, it's going to have whatever that uh, uh, proposal is, it's going to have to be answerable. I'll put it in France or whatever number there is. Um, materials, many of whose characteristics are truly more well known already. Uh, we do know that uh, the nervous system works on a sodium potassium content in a room. It's not any given nitrogen one. Um, and that if we just think of material rather than matter, and it's an easier concept to get hold of, then it seems to me. Well, no, 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 no. I'm happy to agree. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. That's well, it sounds like so past Nemcon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you didn't hear it, uh, Professor Scruton says there is nonsense as well as stuff. So it's obviously <laughs> this, this is a dualist approach to the universe, a sort of Manichaean uh, uh, epistemology. They, now, the gentleman from Siena gave, um, I think, uh, gave Peter and I a bad time. Can you now give uh, Barry and David a bad time? Yeah. yeah. Just two small questions. One is for, for uh, Professor Smith, uh, when you talk about interoception, in particular understanding the mental state of others. You said more or less that, uh, if I understood the right, that is a mental process. What do you think about uh, the fact that uh, understanding others' mind and the mental state of others is intermental process? That means that uh, a subject, uh, uh, in order to understand others, is uh, also grasping information coming from others at the same time in which is made a knowledge of mental state of others. So I would like to ask you the influence in the intermental uh, uh, condition and process in understanding mental state of others. The sure. first question. Sure, uh, I mean second one, the question is... Uh, just one at a time, so a few more want to speak. No, just just one, one question, a rationing to one per yeah, person. Yeah. You know, just very, uh, what do you think about, um, of course, I've lost control. About matter, yeah. Yeah different kind of matter, I, I think that... Uh, you have to ignore the second question because it's out over the rack. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what do you think about, from materialist point of view, about uh, how we can grasp concept uh, of value, meaning and significance from materialist point of view? I, I think there's one for Barry there and one for David after all. So Barry, do you want to deal with yeah, part sure. A? Um, sure. I mean, I, it, it's certainly true that other people affect us and that as, when we're able to read the impact of their effect on us, then we may know more about them and more about ourselves, that's true. I mean, I think the, the interesting things that go on in the way they affect us can be below the level of consciousness, below the radar. Chemical signaling, it turns out that uh, smell can have a huge impact on you, uh, can give you all sorts of clues that you don't think you're aware of or you're not conscious of at all, but they can change your mood, they can change your attitude to someone, they can change the, the level of um, uh, emotional response you have. But, um, so I think how, the, how they're affecting us and how we take advantage of that is interesting. Sometimes we'll take advantage of it by being conscious of how they're affecting us. It's a kind of clue, this person is winding me up or this person is you know, uh, 
kind of putting me at my ease. I mean, we might be aware, but sometimes it's, it's not like that at all. So, I mean, the mirror neuron story about when you smile, or when people smile, um, because I read the smiling of a face by something which in me would not only represent uh, that, that movement, but would be the very thing I would use to produce the movement, it's probably very connected to the emotional responses that go with that gesture, and therefore they can be aroused, and then I find myself feeling very happy, and, and, and as it were, feeling a sense of sharing with you. But we're not really sharing. Neuroscientists are very bad at this. They say, oh, we're sharing a feeling. Well, we can share a park bench. I don't think we can share a feeling. Um, but, but what we're doing is being in similar states, and being in similar states by being affected by other people in, in our motor system, and that leading to effect on our uh, emotional systems. So yes, other people affect us, and we can either consciously or unconsciously take advantage of that to read them, sure. Oh, thank you, and David, part two. You asked some very big questions. How do I account for value, meaning, and significance in a materialist? Uh, meaning, it mean, so meaning sometimes means meaning of life, but at other times it means what Ray was talking about, intentionality. How is it that one thing, and he wrote it on paper, or thoughts can stand for something else? I mean, that's something I've worked on quite a lot. I think it's important in discussing that to one side the consciousness of the thoughts, because explaining consciousness is another task as well. And I think to understand how thoughts can be about something else, one needs to think about it from a biological perspective. One needs to think about how organisms in general Simon Blackburn tomorrow, yeah. he'll yeah. be talking about this. In fact, I'm much more realist. I think that values are things out there in the world. I think that if we have honesty, we have empathy, we have courage, they're what they are independently of how people think about them. As it happens, uh, most people happily are motivated in certain ways by those things, but I don't think what, that's what makes those things valuable. I think they're valuable just in virtue of their own features. In the first part of his answer, David very modestly was not referring to his book, Telia Semantics, which I have read, and I am aware of the work in Intentionality, I just disagree with it. <laughs> I had to get that in. One final question. Oh, yes, Murray, I think, uh, I think yes. Uh, this gentleman halfway up in the blue shirt, very expensive looking shirt, yes. Thank you. Um, so on this question of uh, uh, the conditional materialism uh, you know, entails despair, value and uh, lack of free will and so on. So picture the following scenario. So I'm sitting at dinner this evening and in front of me, suddenly put in front of me is a plate of chocolates. And there are two very nice looking types of chocolates on this plate of chocolates. But opposite me is sitting David. And just at that moment, David delivers the final you know, knockdown argument in favor of materialism. And uh, there, you know, I turn back to this plate of chocolates and uh, uh, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Do I sit there and just think, you know, out of, I'm in a state of complete despair. Who cares about the chocolates? I have no free will to choose between these two chocolates, and they have no value anyway. <laughs> no, I don't. I reach out, I make a decision, and I take the chocolate. So, it, and this may sound like a kind of trite point, but in fact, I think it's actually a very deep one. That in fact, even if we were persuaded of these kinds of, of, a, of materialism, I don't think it needs to make any difference to, uh, to, to our lives and the way we lead our lives. And it applies not just to chocolates, but of course to deeper things as well. So, metaphysical indifference. Gentlemen? So, I think Murray's, Murray's point is, is great. But you might feel that if materialism were true, it wouldn't really be a valuable chocolate. You wouldn't really be choosing. But something very much like that would be going on anyway. Something very close. And it would be good enough for me. And I think you're right that we would go on behaving that way. But... Um, just as we changed our ways 
when Freudian talk of the unconscious finally seeped into the sort of popular mind and people can attribute unconscious states to others. So I think there are chances for changes in our conception of our own experience, choosing, and so on that might come from other discoveries too. So the chocolate may leave it, lose its flavor yet. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, alas, it's half past nine, but not so alas, because the reason that I'm stopping things is we go to the get epistemology section of the philosophy, which of course, as we all go to the pub and gather together. But um, I, just thinking of that William James quote, it reminded me what Austin said about existence. He said it was like breathing, only quieter. I think that was his definition of existence, wasn't it? Anyway, I've had a fantastic time tonight. Thank you. I haven't agreed with everything the gentleman has said, but I've found myself in more agreement than I've uh, been surprised. So thank you very much indeed for being gentle with me. And thank you. And <laughs>